Alrighty, welcome back every <clears throat> everyone. We just broke down that crazy game in South Carolina this past weekend. LSU gets a very close win, 36-33 to in that one, and a lot of people asking questions of the SEC office around officiating today. I can promise you that around Columbia, South Carolina. But let's get into the other SEC teams that played today, at least the ones that played marquee games today. And I do want to start with that Bama game because... I talked about how the LSU game, in my opinion, was the mo most important or the biggest win of the uh, weekend, at least in terms of keeping them in the hunt, keeping them in the race for the CFP, and just keeping their head above water more than anything else. But Alabama, I think, had the most impressive win. I, I think when I wa was watching this game, there were a number of moments where you felt like, okay, Alabama at some point is going to come back down to earth. At some point, Jalen Milrow is going to miss someone, and Wisconsin's going to get a pick, and this th get thing will at least get a little bit closer. It didn't even get close to that. Alabama was absolutely a well-oiled machine on Saturday, and they did everything that you would possibly want Jalen Milrow to do throughout this game. So it was really impressive. Wisconsin was just outmatched in this one. Losing Tyler Van Dyke played a huge part in that offense, just going totally stagnant. But to be fair, I, even if he was in, I don't know if it would have gone much better, if I'm being honest. But I do think this Bama team has kind of found itself on offense. I think they know exactly how they want to go about business, and it's more efficient than a year ago, which is a very scary reality for a lot of the teams that have them on their schedule. But how Bama won this game, a lot of it has to do with Wisconsin. This Wisconsin offense is as confusing of a thing as there is in the entire country. I have no earthly idea what Wisconsin wants to be. I have no idea if they want to be a run-first team or a pass-first team. I think Phil Longo coming in, you thought they were going to lean a little bit more towards the pass, but the best players on your team are the two running backs, Ches uh, Malusi and Tywee Walker, they're not getting the ball enough. And I understand you're playing from behind. You have to pass the ball. That is a huge part of this. So not necessarily taking anything away from the play calling because I understand the circumstances. The reality is Ches Malusi getting 11 carries in a game just can't happen. Uh, I understand you were down early. You weren't down early enough and, long, and big enough of a margin for that to just totally get out of your game plan. So I just thought it was a little bit bland. I didn't have an idea of what uh, Wisconsin wants to be going forward. There were not a lot of great uh, passes. There was no receiver with uh, outside of Will Paulding that had more than two catches. They were all over the place, and there was no real discernible identity among this offense, and if they don't find one in the hurry, this is going to be an ugly season for Wisconsin. And then you dominated the middle eight. I think Nick Saban would be about as happy as anyone that they dominated the middle eight in this game because that was one of the things Saban preached just to the rooftops. He was very, very uh, intent on them winning those Four minutes at, at coming or going into halftime, and then the four minutes coming out, absolutely huge. And Bama got a missed field goal, a, a touchdown, halftime, and then a touchdown. So did exactly what you would want to do if you were a Nick Saban type guy. But overall, I think the knockout punch was right before they went into halftime. A drive where they had two passes. Ryan Williams, who is still outright insane as a 17-year-old, just giving you an update. He is still incredible. And then Jeremy Bernard in the corner of the end zone. Two of the better passes that I've seen Jalen Milrow throw and frankly he made three or four passes in this game that might have been up towards the top 10 throws that I've seen him make particularly the first touchdown to Ryan Williams being able to make that throw in that spot is really really impressive and shows you kind of the the strides that Milrow has taken I think there's a number of things that he hasn't necessarily come too too far in including the intermediate passing game the more NFL level throws doesn't sound like he really needs to. If they're going to run the offense this efficiently with him going tw uh, 12 for 17, 196 through the air, three touchdowns, 14 carries, 75 yards, two touchdowns, it's never going to be a problem. If you're running the ball uh, the ball that efficiently, if you're doing everything you wanted to do on the offensive side of the ball with Milrow, it doesn't matter if he's making those NFL throws. He is a Heisman-level uh, player, and it definitely is in the Heisman conversation. I had a take earlier uh, last week talking about he was going to be the story of the weekend coming out. I feel pretty good about that. I think Jalen Milrow was the story coming out of this weekend. Well, probably would have been more so if there weren't these upsets that we'll talk about here in a second, but really impre impressive performance, and as far as I'm concerned, he is right up there in the top five of the Heisman odds right about now. But... Let's get into this A&M game, and we'll keep this one a little bit short and sweet just to leave my Florida fans alone for a second, but this was it. Um, this was the, the knockout punch. This was everything that 
was wrong about Florida, everything you worried about as a Florida fan, everything that you dreaded as a Florida fan, it was all on display this uh, this past Saturday, and there were a number of things that, frankly, went their direction going into this game. Marcel Reed came in as a backup quarterback, playing in the swamp in front of a fan base that knew they needed the win, and against a team that knew they needed the win, against a coach that knew he needed the win, and they came up flat. Florida did not play even remotely a good game in this in this one. There was not even a chance that they were going to be able to compete with this team pretty much from the jump. There was no uh, consistency on offense. The uh, defense got absolutely run all over by this A&M team, and we'll get into that here in a second. But overall, this was an exclamation point on the uh, Napier era. This was an absolute period. You're at home, back against the wall, backup quarterback on the other side, and you just get dominated. From start to finish, you just get rolled in. The good news is, this is only the second most embarrassing thing to happen to a Florida team on Saturday, so take it for what you will. But at the end of the day, it's hard for me to say anything other than Billy Napier will not be the head coach of Florida for, let's call my shot, in the next 48 hours. He will not be the head coach of Florida anymore, and they will be taking that flight to Mississippi State here in a couple of days without him. But a lot of stuff has to happen after that. Uh, it's going to be a crazy, crazy couple of months around uh, Gainesville, Florida, and you got to hope you can keep DJ Lagway intact. That's the big time goal, and we'll see what happens there. But it's about to go crazy at Florida. That's just the end all be all of this game. But let's get into how AM won. Marcel Reed was really impressive in this game, and it asked, it begged a lot of questions more than anything else because he went 11 for 17, 178 yards, two touchdowns through the air, 13 carries, 83 yards, and a touchdown on the ground. He did everything that they needed them to do, and more than anything, he gave them an identity. I knew what AM wanted to do on offense uh, on Saturday rather than what we saw in the first week where had no earthly idea. I did not know what they wanted to be. I did not know if they were capable of being much of anything on offense. Marcel Reed gives them a central point, which is we're going to run the ball. We're going to make it really multiple, really tough for you to figure out a way to uh, stop that run. And then we're going to pick our moments in the pass game. They got a big play to Cyrus Allen, a number of things that Frankly, it's hard for me to uh, look forward and say Connor Wegman should be the quarterback going forward. I am confused how he was the quarterback coming out in the Notre Dame game. But at the end of the day, this is the kid that gives you a better chance to win because this is the kid that gives you an identity on offense. Connor Wegman just doesn't. He might be the more talented player. Doesn't necessarily matter at this very moment. Your job is to win games, and I think as right as of right now, Marcel Reed gives you a better chance. And then we talked about Marcel uh, Marcel Reed's running ability. He was part of three guys that had 13 or more carries and 60 or more rushing yards in this game. They were all over the place, and they ran the ball in such a variety of ways that A and M could do everything, in, or Florida could do everything in their power. They weren't going to stop all these guys, and a lot of it had to do with the really gross uh, conditions early on in the second half, but a number of really, really big players stepped up for them. Amari Daniels played a really good game. Le'Veon Moss was awesome. EJ Smith made one of the craziest cuts that I've ever seen in my entire life when it was down really, really gross down there on the field, but Le'Veon Moss stepping up is huge, 110 yards on the ground in this game badly need someone to take the reins in that running back room, and I think Le'Veon Moss will likely be that guy. And then finally, D-line domination. This was as glaringly obvious as it was the first couple of weeks for Florida, where Florida went 25 carries, 52 yards on the ground. a and got home twice with sacks, but they were disrupted throughout this entire game. It was absolute nightmare for those two quarterbacks and put them in a position where they were going to make mistakes, and frankly, you couldn't make mistakes in this game if you wanted to win. So overall, this Florida team is uh, broken. Uh, there's really no other way to put it. They have so many things to figure out, including who their next ne- head coach is going to be, and then you got about a million other things to figure out. So it's going to be interesting to watch this unfold. There's no two ways about that. We will keep you updated as things start to go down. I tend to believe we will get news about Billy Napier being fired here pretty soon. They had a board meeting yesterday, and I have to imagine that a decision was made there. So we'll see what happens with that over the next little bit and who's coming to take over in Gainesville because, as we know, it's a uh, it's going to be an interesting hire at the very least. I think Lane Kiffin has been thrown around, and I won't put too much credence into that right now, but what I can say is uh, if I was Lane Kiffin, I would take Florida over Ole Miss. But I'll leave it at that right now, and we'll see what happens uh, going forward. 
Missouri had a really interesting win over Boston College. It kind of went the way that I thought it was going to go in this game. Uh, Boston College came out to a really quick start. Missouri was a little bit sluggish after a couple of games playing inferior opponents. That's pretty much bound to happen. It's very, very tough to walk into these games where the elevation is so aggressive when it comes to the talent level on the other side. It's usually going to take you a little bit of time. So fell down 14-3 to in this game, then scored 24 straight points. Took the lead and never gave it back. Boston College did get a touchdown to make this one look a little bit better and a little bit more interesting, but overall, Missouri able to handle business here. I was really impressed with Boston College. I think this is one of those games where a lot of people thought maybe Boston College will be frisky for a little bit, but Missouri will end up pulling away. They'll, you know, do the SEC thing where they kind of just dominate other conferences and take care of business, especially when they need to. That's not really what happened. Boston College did a really good job throughout this game, at least keeping Missouri in arm's length with his not an easy thing to do with a lot of the other guys around there. But for Missouri, they are a team that can win the SEC. They are continue to roll along, continue to do what they need to do. Now, I still have big time questions about that back end. I still have questions about this defense overall, but they did enough on Saturday. And now you turn your sights to the SEC play and you see what happens. But how they won this game, I think huge turnovers is as big of a part of this as really anything. When you talk about Reed Harris had a uh, pick early on in this game when a lot of things were not going Missouri's way on the BC 25, and Missouri got their first touchdown of the game. And then later on in the game, Drayden Norwood got a big time pick, and it wasn't necessarily like Missouri came right back down and scored, but they were able to set up a drive a little bit later on that went 13 plays, took seven and a half minutes off the clock. So was really, really impressive, and Missouri went up 13 during that. So it was one of those things where they didn't necessarily dominate defensively, at least throughout this game. There were a number of moments where Boston College had to feel pretty good about what they were doing offensively, but they made the plays. Missouri made the number of plays that they needed to make, which on Saturday ended up being two, Um, and they likely will have to make more coming forward, but this was enough to get that job done. And then Luther Burden is just downright incredible. It wasn't like he lit up, the, well, he did light up the stat sheet, but not to the extent that he probably can. Uh, he had six catches, 117 yards, a touchdown in this game. And that's not even what makes him special. That's not even the thing on this offense that makes him the biggest thing to worry about. It's what he does to defenses. He manipulates safeties and linebackers and corners in such a way that no one else in the country does. And it's so impressive, not only because, you know, he is such a big player that you'd like to get the ball, but he does a lot of the dirty work just opening routes for other people. And the other people are really good. Theo Weiss is awesome. Mookie Cooper is awesome. Mar- uh, Marquise Johnson is really good. There are so many guys out there that you can key on all those other guys. You're more than welcome to. Luther Burden's going to go for 250. You want to key on Luther Burden and stop him? Fine. He's still going to go for 100 yards, and everyone else on the field is going to be open. So it's a nightmare. You can't really defend this team, at least consistently, on the passing attack because there's too many guys. And then that guy in the middle is downright terrifying. Um, And then finally, the defense tightening the screws was huge. Um, Early, Boston College was doing pretty much exactly what they wanted to do, rolling the clock, uh, running the ball, keeping that defense off balance, especially with the quarterback run game. And then the defense was able to figure it out for Missouri. They were able to keep Thomas uh, Thomas Castellanos kind of just at bay at the very least, not an easy guy to keep in the pocket. But at the end of the day, his running ability was much less of a factor in the second half of this game. So it was one of those things that you just needed a couple of plays from that Missouri defense, and they really got them down the stretch of this one. So really impressive performance. I think it was one of those games that you could come out of it and say, well, it's Boston College. Missouri should have won by more. But the reality is down 14-3 early on in the game in a game that is going to be – was comfortably the toughest that Missouri's played thus far being able to come back and win is a big deal keeps them in the hunt keeps them where they want to be and they're just playing really fun football right now so Missouri is one of those teams that I've been open about I've been a little bit skeptical of them and I still am going as we head into SEC schedule but they got a lot of things going for them that's for sure this defense is playing really good football right about now and when you have that receiving core with that guy in the middle of it like Luther Burden a lot of things are going to go right. That's just the reality. So Missouri doing exactly what they needed to do. Bama the exact same way. And then Florida's going to have a new coach here pretty soon. I I feel very, very confident saying that. I don't know how soon, and I don't know when he's going to get fired, but 
might just want to turn on Twitter for notifications because I tend to believe it's going to happen at some point today. But that's just speculation. We'll figure out what happens and we'll keep you updated as it uh, unfolds. But let's take our third break here. And when we come back, we got to do a couple of upset watches because there were a lot around the country this past week. And I'm going to jump into four where a group of five team either went to a... Uh, power five place or invited someone in uh in their place and got a big time win and we'll break those down right after this so stick with us <laughs> 